A reading from the second book of Maccabees. It happened that seven brothers with their mother were arrested and tortured with whips and scourges by the king to force them to eat pork in violation of God's law. One of the brothers, speaking for the others, said, What do you expect to achieve by questioning us? We are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. At the point of death, he said, You accursed fiend, you are depriving us of this present life. But the king of the world will raise us up to live again forever. It is for his loss that we are dying. After him, the third suffered their cruel sport. He put out his tongue at once when told to do so, and bravely held out his hands as he spoke these noble words. It was from heaven that I received these. For the sake of his laws, I disdain them. From him, I hope to receive them again. Even the king and his attendants marveled at the young man's courage, because he regarded his sufferings as nothing. After he had died, they tortured and maltreated the fourth brother in the same way. When he was near death, he said, It is my choice to die at the hands of men with the hope God gives of being raised up by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. The word of the Lord. my steps firmly in your paths. My feet have never faltered. To you I call, for you will surely heed me, O God. Turn your ear to me, hear my word. the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. As for me, in justice I shall behold your face. When I awake, I shall be filled with the vision of your presence. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father 
who has loved us and given us everlasting encouragement and good hope through his grace. Encourage your hearts and strengthen them in every good deed and word. Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us so that the word of the Lord may speed forward and be glorified as it did among you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and wicked people. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We are confident of you in the Lord, that what we instruct you, you are doing and will continue to do. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the endurance of Christ. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead. To him be glory and power forever and Dominus vobiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Lexio sancti evangelii secundum lucam. Gloria si domine. Some Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came forward and put this question to Jesus saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And likewise, all the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, the children of this age marry and remarry. But those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die. They are like angels, and they are children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush, when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, and the God of I Isaac, and he is not the dead God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. 
Verbum Domini. Sooner or later, all of us will come face to face with our mortality. And even our immortality. Maybe not in ourselves, in our own experience of death, but our death of the experience of death of loved ones close to us those of our family and our friends. In this experience of our mortality, and again, our immortality as well, because as Christians, they go together. We believe in body and soul. And that one day, at the resurrection of the dead, that we will be reunited with our soul. So all of us have this somewhat of an experience of eternal life. Sometimes at a very early age, we come into this knowledge of what death is. And sometimes at a teenage year or young adult year, or even in our older age, we come into this encounter even more so about our frailty, our mortality. There's nothing wrong about meditation on death. As a matter of fact, as Christians, it's a very healthy thing to meditate upon our mortality and eternal life and about what heaven will be like. St. Paul says, I has not seen nor ear has heard nor has the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So matter, even no matter how much we meditate upon eternal life, we never can get to a point where we have it completely correct. We can always be growing in our knowledge of who God is and what God has called us to be, who God has called us to be as his children in eternal life. We confess in the creed, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Do we really look forward to that when we say that every single week? Do I look forward to the day when I will rise from the dead? Now, if we're honest, most of us are just really comfortable here, perhaps. And living our life here with God, as hard as that is. But to meditate upon the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. In the first reading, it gives us an account of the Maccabean brothers, the seven brothers who bravely approached their martyrdom. And again, in the reading, they were challenged to disobey God's law. to to turn away from the God of the covenant and his laws and to eat pork or swine. And one after the other went to his martyrdom because he wanted to obey God rather than man. Do we in our own lives 
do we have that conviction that we would rather obey God than sin? Even the least little bit, not even just big sin, mortal sin, but even the, the slightest little venial sin. Would we rather obey God? In the Maccabean brothers, the, the fourth brother, after he had died and was tortured and maltreated, when he was near death, he said, It is my choice to die at the hands of men with the hope God gives of being raised up by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. There was this gradual unveiling, if you will, of the reality of the resurrection from the dead, that there would be eternal life with God in heaven throughout the sacred scriptures, throughout the text, in the readings of the, especially the prophets, talk a lot about eternal life. Prophet Isaiah, the prophet Ezekiel. And in the gospel, why did the Sadducees deny that there was a resurrection? They cannot conceive of a heaven beyond what they saw with their own eyes. They did not believe in immortality, that there was a life after death, the Sadducees, that is. There's a, a difference between what the Sadducees believed and what the Pharisees believed. The heresy of the Sadducees was not only that the body would die, but that the soul would die along with the body. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are often spoken of together in the scriptures, but here on the resurrection, their views are completely polar opposite. The Sadducees' idea of heaven was the same as living here on earth. Nothing changes. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection from the dead. They believed in the existence of angels and evil spirits, while the Sadducees denied the existence of both. The Pharisees believed in and hoped for the coming of the Messiah. The Sadducees did not. For the Sadducees, a Messiah would introduce a disturbance. And this is why they are so disturbed in the reading this morning in the Gospel. They did not think they needed to be liberated at all. We only need a Messiah if we think we need to be saved. If we think we need liberation. The religion of the Sadducees was grounded on an earthly vision of heaven. And they challenged Jesus with the question, that according to their own view of heaven would be totally absurd. And this is the gospel reading forward. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman, but died childless. Then the second and the third married her, and the likewise all the seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? Think about this. For all seven had been married to her. Their view of heaven, that is the Sadducees, twisted as it was, was absorbed in our mortality. Without a view of heaven. Without a view of the eternal life. It would be exactly as it was now. Whose wife would she be? And if we don't have a, a theology, a, a, an understanding of eternal life, that in heaven there will be, as Jesus says, there will be, be no giving and taking in marriage, that ultimately we, we will be married to God himself. 
in a different understanding of marriage, we'll be, we will be united to God himself. And this could be very comforting for some, but maybe propose a conflict for others. Sometimes you may think, well, well, I want to be with my spouse forever in heaven. Well, God willing, you will be. But will your spouse be the way that you look at your spouse here now, here on earth, will be completely different from the way that the reality will be in heaven. And this makes sense because when somebody dies, they're free to remarry. And if somebody has two or three spouses because of death, because of one or, or the other spouse, when they get to heaven, whose spouse will they be? That's what the gospel is trying to outlay, lay out for us today. The reality of, of whose will we be in heaven. And basically the answer is we will belong to God in heaven. And even now we are completely his. We belong to God. Do we live in this mindset that you and I belong to God? The Lord Jesus stumps them with the response, the children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die for they are like angels, they are the children of God because they are the ones who will rise. In other words, life in heaven will be much different than it is here on earth. And I say, thanks be to God. Life in heaven, it's good to meditate upon what life will be like in heaven. Jesus answered arguments in language that those who were willing to listen would understand very often. And he talked to them in their own language using their own terms and gently correcting their own misunderstanding. And isn't this why so many people were attracted to the teachings of Christ. He never came down with an iron fist like a dictator, but always in a way that he was directing them to the truth, even if he had to correct their misunderstanding in their way of understanding not just mortal life, but eternal life. Jesus had this way to reorient them to the truth. The truth about who he, he is as God the Son, the second person of the most blessed Trinity. Capital T, truth. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus gives us the model for correcting those in error with charity. Granted, Jesus is truth personified. We're not God. God can correct in the way God corrects. He is God, so only truth can come from his lips, no error from his lips. But we can learn a lesson from the Son of God on how to bring people to the truth in charity, especially if we think about the way that Jesus handled the Pharisees and the Sadducees, most of all the Sadducees in today's gospel. How he drew people to the truth. 
the truth in love, and the truth in charity. And there's many different examples we can think of in the lives of the saints on how they lived their lives and how they taught and how they brought people back to the truth in understanding of eternal life and this life. You know, I can think of Pope St. John Paul II was a master at this. You know, besides being a theologian, he was a philosopher. So Pope St. John Paul II, as a young man, he was a poet and a playwright, and he had the experience of growing up in totalitarian resigns. He had the experience of seeing his friends who were Jews carted off and put to slaughter to death. And he had this brilliant mind and he understood the, the importance of literature and poetry and plays. And he had this ability to bring people into the truth without, in a sense, directly confronting them in a way that was hurtful. And this is a challenge. This is a real challenge for anybody in, in evangelizing and what it means to convey uh, the truth. And truth is never imposed. Truth is always proposed. There's a difference between imposing something, and you see this so often in the the reality of dictatorships imposing what they believe, making people what believe what they want to believe. And the difference between that and proposing the truth. The God-man is always proposing the truth. You can say in a way that he proposes as the bridegroom, Jesus is the bridegroom, and each one of us is bride as the mystical body of the church. And so as bridegroom, what does a, a, a man usually do to a woman? He, a man usually, what, gets down on his knee when he proposes? Not usually right knee, but usually it's supposed to be left knee, right knee for God, left knee for a human being. But in a sense, God, in the, not in a sense, but in reality, God proposes to his creatures. He proposes as bride, as bridegroom. And we are friends of the bridegroom. <clears throat> We are his children, as it says in the gospel. So John Paul II had this, this way, and this, if you read his writings, especially as he was a priest and a, a bishop and then a cardinal, and then finally he became um, the Roman pontiff, the pope, he had this way of proposing the truth the reality of who God is and the reality of who you are in a way that was attractive. In a way that he was drawing you into the reality of the truth so that we may understand better who we are and who God is. Another person is obviously, I'm biased, Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica had this amazing charism, amazing way of bringing people into the reality of who God is and who we are in our fallen human condition. Just like to share with you some of the things that 
she said in some of her writings, she says that some people might think that talking about death is crazy or morose. But I rather like the subject because it makes people focus on how they are handling life. How true that is. Sometimes when we think about our own mortality, when we think about our own death and where we are going, hopefully, eternal life, we think about how we are living now. Are there any obstacles in my life that are pre preventing me from seeing God more clearly? Are there any obstacles in my life that are preventing me from the life of grace? Or even relationships with other people? Have I caused anyone any harm? And if so, perhaps I need to reconcile with people. At the end of the liturgical year, the cycle, before we're a couple of weeks away from Advent, the church focuses on the, the reality of eternal life, where we are going. The readings are meant to shake us up a bit. For us to meditate upon the reality of who we are and how am I living my life. Mother says, discussing death gives us the urgency to explore our relationship with God and to identify the meaning of our life, the purpose of our life. And it's good for us to meditate upon that often. What is the purpose of my life? What is the meaning of my life? That may look different for somebody asking that question as a teenager and then in their 20s and 30s and 40s i know now in my 40s i when i think about that question things pop up in my mind and in, in my heart that were different than when i was a teenager first of all i don't think i was asking that question when i was a teenager <laughs> but probably more so in my, my 20s and 30s and 40s and so on. Hopefully we're asking the meaning, what is the meaning and purpose of my life now? And where am I going? She says, if we confront our death as intelligent human beings, we must at the same time confront our own sanctity, that is holiness. Are we living in holiness? Are we living in the state of grace? She says, pursuing holiness is not a hobby. It's a full-time job. And thinking about death can help us to get our act together. I love mothers. Just She has this way, an Italian way of just kind of like a grandmother slapping you on the face. Get your act together. Where are you going? What is your life about? You know, very often my grandparents had to do this to me. You know, God does this to us, of course, very gently. He wants to draw us into himself, into his own life. And we, when we profess that in the resurrection of the dead, in the life of the world to come, especially... In, in light of what we believe in the creed, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. When we say that today, very shortly, really ponder that. Maybe throughout this Mass would be a good way to ponder, do I think about the life of the world to come? Do I think about those who have already died in my life friends, spouses, family members? Do I pray for them when I come to Mass? And do I bring them to the altar of God? 
Remember what St. Monica used to say to her son years after she had prayed for his conversion, he came back to the faith. Before she died, what did she say to her son? Son, remember me at the altar. Almost every time I come to this altar, I have in my mind my grandparents, the ones who pass on the faith. I haven't lost a parent yet, but I think about people who I love, who had an influence on my life. I bring them to the altar with me, and I offer, offer them to God. And hope to be united and, and even think about what it might be like to be reunited with them for all eternity. And it brings me not sadness, it brings me great joy to think about what it might be to be reunited with my loved ones that have gone before us marked with the sign of faith. Let us stand and profess our faith. I believe.